you know, there'd be people that would be offended, like, I have a brother or a sister that's disabled. This is why it works. It's not me saying these things about you. It's you saying these things about you. Oh, because you. I'm disabled, I yeah, can... Yeah, you can do it. Just like it's, if I was black, I you could... could... Yeah, let's not even say it. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. The, you know, the, the word. Yeah. Yeah. Or if I was Gay. R word, R I word. could... Well, I don't even want to say it because now Racist? people get so mad. Racist? No, retarded. So you made oh, me yeah. say it. <laughs> You can't say that word. Right, see? Yeah, yeah. you can't say that word. Um, or, you know, if you were gay, you could use the F word. Not the, not the oh, F word the, we like. the cigarette yeah. Yeah. word? Yeah, you could use all those words. We're, we're even afraid to talk about the word that we're talking about. Yeah. That's what we're, that's the uh, era we live in. Yeah. I, I, I don't even want to say, say the T word because that just just destroys everything like the only happiness i get in life is when i forget that trump is president oh but i don't let but you but then that. when it gets i don't let you forget when that. you or somebody else is like hey remember this <laughs> this is a new thing it's like i'm just trying to forget that that was a thing and i can't it's yeah, uh, I don't think we're. I don't think we live in a world where we're allowed to forget things like that anymore. Oh, because God. if you do, you get complacent and you think, yeah, it's not been so bad. It's just everywhere. But, yeah. Ugh. With, with any of those things, not just the the Captain Cheeto, but uh, <laughs> you know who I'm talking about. You know, yeah. Spike Lee calls him Agent Orange, and I think that that's funny. Yeah. Well, I'm depressed. Uh, I know. That's what I see. <laughs> That's this is the, the new... effect you have on people. No, that's the T word. <laughs> you just leave. That's the new word. I'm T. I'm T pressed. T pressed. Trump yes. pressed. Yes. I'm Trump pressed. Yeah. It, it's it's a, should be a syndrome. I bet years from now it will be a syndrome that where everyone who had to live through this is <laughs> had to live through this. Yeah. It'll be <laughs> what is what is PTSD? It's, yeah, post traumatic uh, stress disorder. So this it will be TTSD. Uh, Trump traumatic <laughs> stress syndrome or post Trump stress. I just want to point out to everyone listening while Brad will constantly harp on me for bringing things up, he is the one that brought it up and he is the one that has not let it go. He's continued to talk about it. I'm talking for about five minutes how now. it's the new thing that yeah. ruins that shits on conversations. <laughs> <laughs> you really want it. It's like the. You want to ruin the mood or a party, whatever. You just say the T word and it just ruins. I'd like to test that out in real life. Go to a party and just, I'm going to trump the I'm gonna, shit out of I'm going to trump all over this place. I'm going to trump all over this party. I will be the party pooper. <laughs> Okay, everybody, quiet on the set. Uh, yeah, Film Reverie Podcast. I'm pretty sure it's take 71. And action. Hello, Film Reverie listeners. This is Michael Beckemeyer, and I am joined, as always, by... It's me, Balding Ewok. And he's eating white chocolate peppermint M&Ms in front of me, knowing that I'm on a, on a no-sugar thing. That's a pretty dick move, Brad. Because those are good. You you know those I are think. good. Oh, you're eating them. You don't know if they're good or not. I don't like white chocolate. I bought the wrong M and M's. You can't. Nothing. Nothing works on you. You can't be happy about anything. <laughs> Today, our our guest for our, this conversation is someone's been on our show before, but uh, he knows so much. We had to have him back on. <laughs> he has so much to say. We had to have him back on so that we could. Um, pick his brain some more it's marty lang so hello marty hey what's going on guys <laughs> how's it going um Good. i remember the last time you were on our show it was one of those um hey do you want to come on our show and i said and he and you said yeah sure when i was like well we we kind of had a guy bail on us this afternoon you want to do it? And he said yeah sure hop on and uh <laughs> Yeah, you know, it was a little a little more difficult scheduling the both of us this time because we've been so much so much busier. But we're so much more successful now. We have so right. much more going on. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so uh, so what's been going on? You are what uh, you work at? For a while, you were teaching. 
Yep. Um, so I, I live in Southern California now. I live in Los Angeles. Um, and I was in Connecticut for a long time, and I used to be a teacher at Quinnipiac University. Uh, and then I moved out west, uh, and I worked for the film school of Chapman University for a couple of years. I was the production manager there. Uh, and I taught crowdfunding and audience development for the directing and producing students, which was pretty cool. Uh, then I decided to go back to school. So I moved to uh, North LA, to Northridge in the San Fernando Valley, and uh, I go to Cal State Northridge right now. I'm in their Master's of Screenwriting program, and I'm also a member of the staff there. I'm a student resource supervisor, so basically I run our undergrad script library, and I tutor undergrads in screenwriting assignments and filmmaking assignments and stuff like that. Nice. So yeah. how much fun was it being the production manager of students who, who don't exactly no they're sort of there maybe to make make mistakes and learn you know it's a is it a scrambled like organized chaos which film production kind of is anyway but well think of it this way um <laughs> chapman chapman's one of the top one of the top five film schools in the country okay. um and my my second year there I worked on, sort of oversaw the production of about 95 short films Jeez. over the course of nine months. Um, so the joke over there is that Chapman's not so much a film school as it is a movie studio that hands out degrees. So there was a, there was a lot going on there. Uh, but it was a great learning experience. I mean, the kids were learning as much as I was because I was new to Los Angeles and, you know, new to California. So learning how films are made out here, you know, as opposed to on the East Coast was definitely a yeah. cool thing. So yeah, now so, now I know. But th for me, when I when I learned, so much of learning how to do it was just doing it. Even if you go in there and screw it up and mess it up, you know, you're like, well, we don't don't do that again. And then you like, it's almost like a, I don't want to say process elimination because it sounds like nobody knows what's going on at the time. But you figure it out over. I've been making movies. I've been trying to make movies since like the mid '90s, and I have never done it the same way twice because I'm like chiseling. I'm honing in on how I do it the way we are doing it. You know what I mean? So right. like classroom theory and stuff like that, that's all nice. But for me, I teach high school television and I know that anything I explain to them on how it's supposed to be done just goes right. They don't in one ear and out the other, they don't really care. And then they go off and they do the same thing I told them not to do. And then, then I can say, see, this is what I was saying not to do. And they go, Oh, all of your students must've gone to Chapman. That's really funny. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of that. I mean, when you're when you're in high school or you're in college and you wanna you wanna make this a career, there's definitely sort of a an insistence on doing things the way you want to do them. You know, whether or not you're getting advice to do it a different way. Right. But I mean, that's part of the process, like you say. You know, you got to go through. You got to take your lumps and you got to do things that get you in trouble and do things that don't work before you figure out things that do work. So that's, that's kind of the, the joy and the struggle of, uh, of working in film education is seeing, you know, students who are going through that process, doing things that you know will create problems for them, but that they don't know. Yeah. So it's literally like kind of watching their brains expand, you know, as they, as they struggle with the uh, effects of their decision. <laughs> that's a nice way of putting it. Their brain's expanding, not exploding. <laughs> Right, expanding. Yeah. So uh, I didn't realize that there was a textbook on how to crowdfund. Like, I just need that book and I'll know how to do it and it'll all work out for me. We won't. We still won't do it. <laughs> you, didn't you, did you just say you were, you were teaching crowdfunding to the uh, film students? Yeah. Yeah, I, I worked with I worked with the directing and producing students uh, on crowdfunding and audience development. And believe yeah. it or not, there actually is uh, a book about that process. Um, it's written by Richard Botto, uh, RB. He's the oh. CEO of H32. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Crowds and, uh, you call it the crowdsourcing book? The crowdsourcing? Um, it's called uh, Crowdfunding for Indie Film. It's, okay. uh, oh gosh, the subhead of it is uh, Independent Filmmaking and the Power of the Crowd, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, yeah, you can yeah. find out. Amazon, you can find it on Barnes and Noble, uh, and the cool thing is the film that I made in Connecticut, Rising Star, is actually a case study in that book. Oh, so there's cool. about 20, 22 pages on how we made it and the things that we did to build our audience, and nice. you know how we how we engage the local community for it. It's a really really great book. Okay, so we've talked about we we have talked about. I actually can't remember how much we talked about your film on our show and how much we've talked about your film just one on one together, yeah. like just chatting about it. A lot of it was on the Rising Star. So. Tell us, um, give us a rundown of what you did to build your audience, because that's something that uh, I can make 20 movies, uh, 20 great movies, but if there's no one there to watch them, which is currently 
um, my main struggle is that I, I'm just don't there are not enough people who know that what I'm trying to do and appreciate what I'm trying to do. Uh, and we're scrambling to, to do that part of it so that when we have a movie like we do, yeah. they yeah. somebody will want to watch it. <laughs> so <laughs> what's the what's the what's the Marty Lang magic trick on how to do that? Well, there's definitely no magic trick. Um, it's 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 absolutely hard work, and it's it's something that takes time. Um, we had the, the audience that we built for Rising Star was actually built over five years. Um, when I was working at Quinnipiac, we ran uh, a workforce development program every summer in the state of Connecticut. Uh, it was called the Connecticut Film Industry Training Program, and people came in from all over Connecticut as you know, who wanted to get into the film business because at the time Connecticut was a booming area because they had a good film tax credit. There were a lot of films that were coming in to shoot. Uh, so they wanted to build a local workforce. So they hired me to come up with a kind of a curriculum that would help the state develop folks that could work on projects that came into the state. So over the course of five years, we ran this program. It was a, a one month program every June. Uh, so it was over summer break, so college students could do it. And, you know, we had folks that were from high school all the way into their 60s that, uh, that wanted to come and work in the business. And as those groups came through the program, I stayed in touch with them while at the same time I was developing Rising Star. I was, you know, writing the script and starting to look at locations and stuff like that. And basically all it was was just, you know, keeping the project in the forefront of people's minds. Like this is coming down the pike. This is something we're going to make. This is something we'd love to have you help out on. You know, however, you know, people wanted to get involved. So by the time we ran the crowdfunding campaign, we had about 350 people who were directly, you know, engaged with the with the FITP, either as graduates or as you know friends of graduates or people who hired graduates. Um, and I had all their contact information as we went along, so I made sure that I kept them in touch of where we were. And by the time the crowdfunding campaign actually happened. A lot of them wanted to get on board and actually help us either with in-kind donations or with actual financial donations. So that led to us doing the Kickstarter campaign. We raised about $15,000 for that, uh, and that got us into production. We had a crew of about almost 60 people, and I think we only paid nine of them. Um, And that that came from the core of people that worked with us. And then when it came time for distribution... Uh, when the film was done, we had another two years worth of classes that came out. So now we had about 500 people. Um, and those were folks that we wanted to engage to come see the film. Uh, so that ended up, we, we screened the film uh, in downtown Hartford in one of our public parks. Uh, the city of Hartford actually paid for a blow-up movie screen. And we had a whole night uh, where people could come down and see it. We had almost 600 people come down and see the film. So and that was because of the audience that we engaged. It's it's. We suck at that. <laughs> <laughs> I just I was sort of like to say if you didn't love Marty so much you kind of hate him because he makes it sound so easy you know is this a thing now where we hate all of our guests the last guest we had we told him we said fuck you right to his face but we were we were kidding yes I was saying it if you had said it it would have sounded like a real thing like I was just kidding oh I'm a dick okay so um so this is something that we recently talked to talked to you about is how to like switch our um take our film that we have finished that we toiled over for you know 2 years literally I don't when I say two people made it I don't want to make it sound like there wasn't anyone that helped us because there was along the way but it was it was like uh, somebody handed you a pile, handed us a pile of footage, and we had to sort through it and make it happen because it was our film. I can't expect the actors to come in and sit there and start making cuts for us and stuff like that. We we did, oh, of yeah. yeah so, you guys are the driving force. Yep. So we 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 were the ones that did it. It was it was left to no one else, and no one else was going to do it. And we that's the way we wanted it. We didn't we we love making movies, so that's the way we we're going to do it. We didn't have a budget or anything like that. Um, but now that we have a finished film, it's sort of like trying to figure out how best to release it. And, you know, you go through film festival, the idea of film festivals, which I've, I like the idea of my film being in a film festival. It makes me feel good. It strokes my ego a little bit. Look, my movie's up there. It's the, it made the film festival. Look how good every, the, this guy over here says my movie's good. He put it in his film festival. And uh, that's great. That's a great thing. It's great PR and publicity and all of that stuff. But um, it's also really expensive, yeah. time-consuming. you got to raise money just for that. Yeah. 
And because uh, it's what, maybe 50, 70, 50 to maybe $100 to submit a feature length film to a film festival that you're 99% not going to get into. Like, if you send to enough of them, you'll get in, but it's a numbers game. So you got to like throw a whole bunch of your resources at it. And, you know, I'm a high school teacher. I don't have all those. I don't have thousands of dollars of resources. Hey, let's just get this into a million film festivals. So yeah. we, we, Brad and I have been trying to figure out some sort of a release schedule. And um, you gave us some really good ideas. So I guess we'll talk about that a little bit here. Um, yeah. So we have a feature film that we made for, let's just say, not a lot of money. I mean, think of what not a lot of money is and then remove all, almost all of that. And that's how much we made our money for our yeah. movie for. And, uh, you know, uh, it's amazing how little we made it for and how much in debt I still am from trying to pay for all the stuff. But uh, um, but because of that, we it was handmade as homegrown, all that stuff. Like it was literally you, me, maybe three other crew people and the four actors that are in it. There's like was that like less than 10 people that made this thing. Right. Um, um, so it, we love that part of it, but because of that, it's a small project. Not many people know about it. We did try to, we did try to do a post-production crowd fund to raise some funds to <laughs> finish it, uh, ram for the computer, post, uh, film festival submissions and stuff like that. And it did not, it wasn't a successful crowd fund. So we literally just frame by frame pulled it out of our ass. But now that we're done with it, we want to do the best we can to get it out there so that people know that it's there as many people yeah. as we can get well, to know the main it's not just that though we we want to use the this film to uh, enable us to get money for our next film so we want we figured this is our proof of hey look we could yeah. do, make a movie for almost yeah. nothing and it's decent it's better than most of the indie stuff you'll see we think the film only works as a calling card if we remove your scenes though no mine are the best scenes <laughs> <laughs> i am the best part okay okay mr ego my scenes I'm are the best there. scenes you can stop talking you, guys, now. you can just send out trailers the trailers of brad <laughs> it, it might work yeah <laughs> Don't look at me. Like so, uh, so what? What is your like these days? You really don't have to go to get into a film festival. That was like a thing of the nineties. Yeah. Um, you got into a film festival, and that meant you were you were an actual filmmaker, and boom, poof. Uh, but these days, it's not so much the same thing because there there really has been a digital revolution of removing the middleman to distribution. Of course, everybody would like a distribution deal so they can be you know, whatever. But if you, if you are in a position like we are, where it's a really small movie and we just kind of yeah. want to get it out to the crowds there, there are so many ways to do that. Right. Well, there, there's a couple, a couple different paths you can take. Um, one of them is actually one we didn't talk about last time. Um, and that involves festivals that have no submission fees. Um, and if you go to the website film freeway, there's actually a listing that you can pull up of all the festivals that don't have submission fees. So right there is a first sort of avenue of places that you could send the film. And there's festivals all over the country yeah. that don't have submission fees. And some of them, some of them are like nationally ranked. I remember, I don't know if this is still the case, but the, um, there's a festival in Wisconsin, um, that's really good. The flyway film festival. Okay. And for a good amount of time, they didn't have uh, submission fees for films around the time uh, rising star got made. That was the case, but I mean, they're all over the country. And if you go film freeway actually has a listing of them and you can submit all of them, all the film, you know, your film to all those festivals right off the bat and there's no out of pocket. So that's a good kind of start. That's good. And then yeah. hopefully get one or two hits off of that. Then some other festivals might take notice of the film from there. Um, the other one, the other main method, and this is what we had talked about, was kind of putting together a, a do-it-yourself uh, distribution strategy. Uh, and I think that's really important now. Um, when when we finished Rising Star, we did sign with uh, a distributor and we did sign with a producer's rep uh, that helped us get that deal. But since we made that deal, we've had really no hand in the day-to-day -day distribution of the film in places that it's gone. Like, I find out even now, a couple weeks ago, I found out that Rising Star is now on a service. It's called Tubi TV. Uh, and they didn't even let me know that it was going there. So it's it's a common thing for independent filmmakers to sign these deals if they're lucky enough to do so. They become a very low priority on the, the priority list of the distributor 
because they have films that have much bigger budgets and bigger stars. Right, right. And they generate more money from them. So it's yeah. it's an understandable situation, um, but it's not an ideal for the independent filmmaker because you're going to have more passion and more drive to get your film out into the world than any distributor ever would. So yes. it makes sense to, to kind of take that bull by the horns and work on putting the strategy together yourself. Um, you know, one of the things we had talked about um, for, uh, for your film was trying to come up with like a one night only screening in the Orlando area where you can get folks to come out and see the film. You, and, and there's, when you're building an audience for something like that, you want to think, okay, who are all the people that were involved in the project, right? That's sort of like your first wave. You know, any, any backers who are interested in the campaign, successful or not, cast and crew, their friends and families, that's sort of like your first wave. But then the next thing you can do is think sort of like the next circle out and think, okay, are there folks in the Orlando film scene or art scene that might be interested in content like this? And that can be, you know, people who cover, uh, you know, uh, art, arts and entertainment for the Orlando Sentinel or for, you know, any of the local papers around there. Um, it could be high school students or college students that go to one of the local colleges. UCF has a really great film program. Valencia has a great film program. Mm -hmm. That's a place that you could go to drum up interest in the project. You could even do something. This was this was part of what we did when uh, we did Rising Star. We exchanged. Um, well, we actually, we didn't exchange anything. We gave uh, free filmmaking classes to local schools for people who are interested in it just as a way to increase the visibility of the project. When you say we, do you mean you and your partners or the company you were working for that did the summer class thing that you were talking no, about? No, that was us. That was just me and my, my other above-the-line crew members. We, okay. volunteered. we volunteered to go to a middle school and teach multimedia classes. So we went in, and we would bring in, like, props from the movie. We'd bring in script pages yeah. from the movie. And we'd show them, you know, like, this is this, this is a script page. This is a schedule. <clears> you know, things like that. And then we actually made a little two-minute movie with them. Uh, and that became a campaign update on our Kickstarter campaign. Nice. So a lot of ways to kind of, in, you know, incorporate that back into fundraising what, or crowdfunding. What, or two audience pages stuff. From, what two pages from our script could we take to a middle school? <laughs> that and... don't have the F word in it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that first scene. It's a five minute long oh, phone yeah, sex the first scene. One, that's hey guys, we're gonna teach you a little a few things about filmmaking. And <laughs> nature. Think about this, think about this though. If you have you have content that's more adult oriented, right? Right, right, right. If you went to UCF, if you talk to one of the film professors, you know, or somewhere in the film department at UCF and said, I'd like to come in and talk with your seniors about independent filmmaking mm -hmm. and then come in and literally sit down and tell them the story of how crazy it was yeah. and everything that you guys had to go through, professors are going to want that kind of content because it's people that are out there in the world doing stuff. And that's, that's a point of view that students would appreciate. That is a real thought. Um, we actually know the, uh, I think we know the teaching of, uh, the, he teaches directing at UCF. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. Like what we do have, we don't have a standard, here's how you get a movie made story. We have a crazy story. Like you yep. just said, the, of craziness of literally stringing this along. There are scenes that we shot that were such, not a mess, but like we were trying to do so much in one day that mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. we were editing. And I was like, well, I'm glad we have that one take because without this one take, we this part and this part don't fit together. And it was just like, it was like the longest day of my life. Literally, we started at like 2.30 in the afternoon and went until like 8 or 9 o'clock the next morning. It just was like a long day and a long production day, actually. And uh, it was stressful and we didn't get the 18 pages shot that we were trying to get shot. It was a big party scene with like 20 extras, but we got like 15 pages shot and I'd never shot 15 pages in a day before. And yeah. we got everything we needed. We didn't miss anything. When we got back in post-production, I'm, I'm shocked that we didn't miss something. Uh, and it wasn't like it was kept in our head. We followed the rules, like the rules. We had the shot list, draw a yep. line through it when you're done, like basic stuff. Just draw yep. a line through it. And we're like, okay, we've got that. I don't need that anymore. Move on. I could have used an AD to, to do those things for me. So I was yeah. trying to shoot camera and it, do Yeah, because at, at one point it was like, shot list? What shot list? Yeah. I don't know what scene we're on. Gotcha. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, um, that's what happens when you have like three, four crew members Right. <laughs> on a 18 right. hour, a 20, 18 hour day. Yeah. But yeah. So that's a crazy story. That sounds like what not to do to me. 
Well, absolutely. <laughs> but you know what that is? That's something that film students need to hear. Yeah. So what yeah. that is, that's something you can offer. And in exchange for that, when you go in and offer that, you can tell everybody in that classroom, so, hey, now you guys have heard the crazy story of how we made this film. Come down to this theater on March 31st and come check it out. We're having a one-night-only screening of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. where you can build the audience and the yeah. interest you know, for people to come check that out. Why don't you think it's shit like this, we Brad? Could stream, Come on. We could stream that live. What do I have you around here for? We should record that if we do that. Yeah. Um, okay, so that's a that's a great... I'm glad we're recording this because I'm not taking notes. I'm just going to have to listen to yeah. it later, I guess. Um, yeah. What else? So after you after you do your... Uh, in your modern distribution world on a micro, micro budget film, you don't have a lot of resources, budget, you have gone to people and said, hey, remember we made a movie... Uh, tell them about it, film students, blah, 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 mm -hmm. then what? Well, hopefully after you've done that for a couple different times, whether it's at different schools or different arts groups or different book clubs that read books similar to the content of the movie you're making, you know, like you want to, you want to find groups that have an affinity for the type of content that you're making. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, you know, people who are fans of micro budget indie films, yeah. if there's a group yeah. of, of some sort like that in the Orlando area, track them down or anywhere on route four, you know, like that's yeah. the, that's kind of the idea. Um, when you get those people together, then you want to gather them for one night. And you want to have as big an event as you can possibly get for that one night. You don't want to try to four-wall a theater for a week and have a week's worth of screenings because you'd rather have 200 people on one night than 20 people over 10 nights. You know what I mean? Like, you want to make sure that whatever that, that one event is, that it gets attention. Uh, it's very similar to uh, independent authors who come out with books and try to get as many people to buy them on the first day that it's available as possible so that their rankings go up on Amazon and on Barnes and Noble. Yeah. Um, it's that same sort of strategy. Um, you want to make sure that it makes as big a splash as you can. And part of that splash, in addition to getting people there is getting press there. Um, and that's, there are all kinds of independent news sources now, you know, whether they're arts and uh, entertainment related, whether they're local news related, and they would be interested in an event like this because it's hometown people doing something that's really cool. Yeah. So the more people like that that you can get to come to this event, the more people that can cover it. So that's the second step. Yeah. And then the third step, if you're doing this within sort of like a one city area, I think the third step is to have everybody at that event walk away with something that they can tell their friends about. And when it comes to a film, it's the ability to see the film somewhere else. So if you get 200 people that come to the screening, uh, you know, right before right before the film comes, you come out, you introduce yourselves, you know, you say hello, we'll talk a little bit about it after the film, blah, blah, blah. The film plays. When the film is done, you guys might do a little Q&A, something like that, kind of answer questions from the audience. And then as a walk away, you tell them, okay, guys, thank you all so much for coming out and seeing the film. I have great news. The film is now available to watch someplace. It could be on Amazon or iTunes or Seed and Spark, you know, or if you're lucky, like a Netflix or a Hulu or something like that. You can make deals with uh, distributors and aggregators now without the middleman of a distributor. Um, you can use a site called Distriber, uh, which is one that's used quite often. It's part of Indiegogo. Uh, you can also use a site called Quiver, uh, Quiver Digital. And what they do is they place films on services for fees. So if you, rather than spending 300 bucks trying to get your film into a film festival, you can pay 300 bucks and get your film on Amazon Prime Video, and then once you screen the film, you can tell everybody if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch the film there. Mm -hmm. Tell your friends about it, tell your family about it, and then the key thing is that all the press people that come to cover the event that night will then write in their articles, if you want to watch it, it's now available. So now people don't have to wait for another theatrical screening to come see the film. They can go to directly to what platform you have the film set up on already. So, so Quiver, they charge for uh, assisting and getting on to like Amazon. Is mm -hmm. that what you said? Can't you do that? Which is something you something you can do yourself, but a lot of people, right? You can you can yeah. yeah. There's a number there's a number of different services that they work yeah. with that yeah. Quiver work with, and you can figure out where you think the best yeah, place yeah. is for. You kind of thing but yeah 
so that's when an when you put a video when you put a film up on Prime or up on Amazon, like even if yourself or through them, do you like for our film, which is tiny? I don't expect it, the sales of our film to you know rock my world or anything like that. I, I just don't expect it because. It's so small, like nobody, you know what I'm saying? So do you, do you think making it available just to watch on Prime so people can stream it for free? I mean, I realize that you get paid something like a cent, like a, six like cents. 13, 16, six cents for every however many hour, Maybe like an hour of watch time or something like that. But yeah. like, uh, both like for sale and for streaming or not worry about the for sale thing. Uh, you really just good to have a place to send people to watch your movie if they can sort of a thing it, it really depends on the goals that you have for the film yeah. like when we made rising star the goal was never to make money right that's um, how you know, we kind of feel about it it yeah, seems I mean, ridiculous it seems ridiculous to say we didn't intend to make money but that it, it was to prove really honestly to prove to ourselves we can do it to do it and then say whatever happens will be better suited to make a film the next time we do the next thing and not only that being able to show an investor for the next project look what we've already done right 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 that was the key for us with rising star i wanted to make that film because up until then i had only produced features i had never written or directed one Mm -hmm. so i wanted to be able to show people you know not only am i a producer but i can take a film creatively from beginning to end and make it you know according to my own vision as well Mm -hmm. so and that's that's done me really well like that's gotten me conversations with agents and managers since right. so that no I totally understand that like you don't need necessarily need to make a film for a financial goal yeah. um, it doesn't hurt if you spent a lot of money to, to make it um, but that's a whole other conversation um, you know go ahead well you you just said agents you used the first film um, we don't have one I was even the last show we did, we started the show where I was arguing that that's not a thing. You can't get an agent for being a director or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. Is that something we should try and do? Because or... Brad doesn't know what he's talking about. He thinks that you can't. I didn't know directors, there was an agent for directors everything. Directors don't have or need agents. Like anyway, we'll have the conversation what? with him later. We'll educate him. But, later, but so is that a thing? <laughs> is that should that be a goal? Yeah. Getting an agent. Well, I don't see why not. I mean, yeah. it's. It's definitely a more complicated thing than just making a film and getting it to someone. Um, the, the people that I have connections with now out here are relationships that I've built over years. So, and even with them, I still haven't made an ask yet. Like, hey, you know, you want to check this out, kind of thing. What there's one manager uh, out here who I am not rep by, but who I'm friends with, and he watched Rising Star after it came out. And he really liked it. And then he was like, all right, cool. You know, when you have something that you think is marketable and that could sell, let me know. So <laughs> then it's a matter yeah. of, well, no, I mean, that's, that's no, their I job. Know, I know, I know, but just, yeah. yeah, just so, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Know, okay. Cool. It's, it's kind of what your goal is and the kind of content that you want to make. Yeah. You know? Well, yeah, you want to keep making content. Now, I don't want to work at the, uh, the, oh my God, how are we going to pay for this level, uh, for bare minimum prices for like the rest of my career. If we have to, I always say to Brad, Brad and I always say, well, you don't want to do it that way again. But if it came down to it, I would do it that way again because I want to make movies. I'm going to make movies. However the hell I need to do to make movies. Um, just push the ball just a little bit further each time. Like maybe we do it the same way, but how we make it or whatever is better. Like the, the problem, the way we solve the problems is more educated because of the you got more sage wisdom you're working with from the t- from the previous times before. Yep. So, um, well, so a- after that, you get your thing on Amazon or wherever, like you said, Seed and Spark or Hulu or places like that. Um, what do you do to to keep the ball rolling? on getting people like what have you done to keep people from to watch your movie you you had a distrib- distributor so the distributor is sending it places for you in a way like you were just saying it's like you didn't even know it was in, in places which has got to be a frustrating thing how did he get a distributor 
like he sh- he made a good movie. They saw it and bought it, or not bought it, but Didn't whatever. They worked out a deal. Contact someone and say, "Hey, watch this." Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that we we had a producer's rep that we worked with, and they were the ones that had the connections with the distributors. Yeah. So that was the middleman to the middleman. Basically. Okay. <clears throat> Explain the producer's rep. I mean, I know what they they basically are the agent for that film, basically. Yeah. Um, so if you sign with if you sign with a producer's rep, um, normally it's there's an upfront fee that you pay, mm-hmm. uh, and then what they do is they contact people that they know who work for uh, the distributors. You know, so the Netflixes, Hulu's, Amazon's, iTunes, Google Play, places like that, um, and and film distributors in the U.S. And what they do is they send the film out to these places and they see if there are distributors that are interested in picking that film up. Uh, In this case, we had uh, the distributor content film become interested in in it. And then they put a deal together. They sort of act as our rep, you know, for that deal. And then once the deal is made, they sort of act as the, um, I guess, the check and balance on it to make sure that the distributor is living up to the terms of it. Over the Uh, the life of the the deal, like if it's a two-year or a three-year deal, that rep... You're, that rep is still working with your film. Correct. Yeah. And like in our case, we signed a 10-year deal. So okay. this film is, you know, they're working with us for the long haul. So when you say things like the producer rep normally has an upfront fee, that sounds like something that could intimidate people just because of like a lot of people don't have the upfront <laughs> like fee. <you? laughs> All I have is Brad. And I don't think he yeah. wants Brad. I, I, I have pro, I'm living proof you don't want Brad in return of money. <laughs> And and then yeah. a place of money. So <laughs> everybody thinks I'm kidding, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I'm pretending, you know. But anyway, um, so is it is it something that uh, is more affordable than you thought when you? Because was this the first time you went down the producers rep thing for your? Yes. So so it, talk about it. Yeah, I don't. You don't have to use exact numbers or anything like that. But uh, unless you oh, want to, but yeah. I will. Okay. I mean. We, you know, there were a couple different reps that we had talked with, and the numbers that we had gotten were anywhere between, I think it was fifteen hundred bucks up front to about three thousand okay. up front. Yeah, and the that's, ones that that's we significant, up, but it's not like the end of the world money, you know. Right, right. And what ended up happening, the guys that we signed with, um, they uh, they charged us twenty five hundred up front, mm-hmm. which was not. A small amount of money, obviously, yeah. but yeah. it gave us the the peace of mind that we were going to get closer to our ultimate goal, which was to get the film out as wide as we possibly yeah. could. So now, you, trusted, our goal... you trusted them. You trusted yeah. them. It wasn't like just some like uh, get them in and get them out sort of company that you right. yeah you 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 right. uh, vetted vetted them. Make sure yeah, and it, and that's and that was a long process. Like we ended up talking with other folks who worked with them on other films. Yeah. You know, and that's that's something that they actually recommend that we yeah. do, so that, you know everybody's comfortable before moving forward. You know, and then you know once we made the deal, we talked about you know where do you think where do you think the best place for this would be? Um, you know, I had asked them like where are your strongest connections? You know, before we signed, just to you know to get a sense of where the, yeah. the film would go. And then you know went to the content and they liked it and we signed with them. Do you think that there is a producer's rep for every? shitty movie that's out there or do they is it more of an interview process where you're interviewing them and they're interviewing you like they're not there I'm, I'm sure there are people out there that will just take your money and your movie and say sure i'll do what i can and then not really do much but right. you want somebody i guess that appreciates your film for what it is also that loves yeah. i guess you, you can't assume people are going to love your movie as much as you do but you know what right. i mean yeah so yeah yeah, I think our, our biggest thing when when we were talking with them was, you know, I we told them we want this film to go out as wide as we possibly can. It's not so much about what kind of money we can get for it. Yeah. I just want to be able to say my film's playing on five continents. And to that, they said, okay, we can do that. Yeah. And, and that led them to talk with distributors that had an international focus mm. uh, for which content does. They're based out of Los Angeles and also out of London. Um, and so when we made that deal, they said, when we were talking with them, you know, look, we, we have re- relationships with sales reps in a lot of different countries. And after they made the deal, the film started playing on TV in South Africa. 
you know, it started playing on the internet in Malta, like, you know, all these crazy places that, you know, we have no connection to. And, and we started getting like press, like the Malta times, the daily newspaper in that country had a, like a huge full page spread about this movie when it started playing on their uh, local TV station. What, what was their and angle on had, your, like, what was it that drew them? Like, why did they do a whole thing on it? What was the, was it about your, how your movie got made or was it the movie itself? No, it or? Was just, it was the movie itself, the story of it, um, and you know, it's a film that dealt with the uh, the economic crash uh, from 2008 and sort of the aftermath of it. Sort of a love story set, you know, on that. So they thought it was interesting, and, and they're, you know, European countries are very interested in American films generally. Yeah. So that, you know, that was another thing going for it. So you know, like I, I get a copy of that article in my email, and I'm flipping out. I'm like, this is exactly what I wanted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah, I yeah. wanted people all over the world to see this. I get uh, I got fan mail one time on Facebook from uh, a woman in Clerksdorp, South Africa, yeah. who had watched the movie on Starsat, the cable provider down there. She said, hey, I just want to let you know I watched this movie. It's fantastic. You know, I love the characters and all this. Like, yeah. that, that that's why you yeah. do it, you know? Yeah, because you, you make your movie sort of in a vacuum. And in fact, mm-hmm. you don't even make it in a vacuum. You make it in a vacuum that is full of, like, distant particles of people telling you that it's crazy to try to do what you're doing. Uh, it doesn't make sense. Oh, it's too many pages. Blah, blah, blah. You, you know, not using, uh, nobody knows who your actors are. Nobody's going to want to see a movie that doesn't have, language. that doesn't have people in the, in the, yeah, you use the F word too many times. I was like, fuck dude, that's how I talk. So, <laughs> so, um, you know, so you, you hear all that and it's like imposter syndrome and all of that shit. It's just like oh, it's yeah. in there. So when you yeah. get even just like you were just saying, one thing back, I'm sure you've gotten more than that, but like one thing in, it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to focus on that today. Like the one, yeah. the one thing that they came through good. It's like, it's, we podcast, we have two podcasts, yeah. um, film reverie. We talk about filmmaking and then we have our movie isms podcast and yeah. we don't get fan mail often, but when you do, it's like it, somebody it's jiving with somebody and that works because it's hard when you're just talking into a microphone and you're not even like, you don't even have a live audience. You're just recording your thing. It's yeah. anybody listening. You're just talking to this microphone. This microphone knows all my secrets and it's, <laughs> it's the only one because nobody else, you know, so it feels good. Yeah. Yeah, I, you brighten, your face brightened up when you started talking about it. I could, I could just see how oh, cool. how happy it made you. Yeah, it was that was really a great moment, and I made sure to share that with every single person on our casting crew. And <laughs> and I told them like, listen, all that time you put into that little tiny movie that we made in Connecticut, somebody on the other side of the world saw it and liked yeah. it, and that you know that brightened up some other people's yeah. days too. You know, like they got back to me saying it was cool. It was way different. Though. I mean, if you'd getting gotten some a good review from somebody in Connecticut. That's, that's one thing, but somebody in Malta yeah. on the, like you said, the other side of the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, great. so do you feel like there's a certain level of production that just shouldn't go to, like we made our movie for like really, really low budget. Should we even venture out into the, Hey, find a producer's rep and see what happens. Or is there a certain level of tier, like a tier you feel like you we feel good about, here's what we feel good about. We feel good about uh, our, uh, well, what do we feel good about? I'm just kidding. Uh, we feel good about our characters. Our characters, yeah. we, we feel like our characters are strong and the performances we were able to get with our actors kept that feeling going. Like we watch and we think the characters are unrelentingly their, themselves and like it's what we want right. them to be. Yeah. Dialogue we feel pretty strong about. We know it's flawed. There's not a whole lot uh, going on uh, in it. You know, it's like a lot of people sitting in a room and talking. It's like uh, some long scenes. I mean, it, I mean, it really could have been a play in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was on purpose. We did that on purpose, whether it was a good idea or not. But um, yeah. so we know that like part of it is it's almost like uh, just creatively or artistically, it's almost like your own insecurity. Like that girl's not going to want to talk to me. I'm too fat. I'm too, but too, yeah, I'm too, I'm so much older than her, too young you know, for, and it's like all that stuff you try to talk yourself out of. And more and more, I'm realizing that I'm starting, I'm, I'm tuning into my own little 
prejudging, like not, I, I guess not like I hear, I talk my, I catch myself talking myself out of things because I know what I would think if someone handed me a movie that got made for our budget before I'd even look at it, I'd go, you made it for what? And you, you expect it to be good. You know what I mean? It's, it's the, I guess it's imposter syndrome, but at the same time, just like insecurity about what you, what you're working with. You know what I mean? I, well, the, the thing I can say to that is I know of three films that were made for $10,000 or less that were nominated for Independent Spirit Awards. Yeah. Well, you, know, you, you just of, convinced me. Good job. You, <laughs> <laughs> Good job. That, that works. Let's look at I him. Mean, He's like the Zen master over here. <laughs> Why no? Da, 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 just the one thing I needed to hear. <laughs> <laughs> the, thing, the thing I always used to say when, when I was producing was it doesn't matter how much a film costs it matters how much it's worth. Yeah. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah. And if you're good at making a dollar stretch, then you can get that. You can completely eliminate that as a factor from the conversation. Yeah. If you make a beautiful film for a little bit of money, nobody's going to care what you spend on it. People are going to want to watch it. I see movies on, I won't name any of them because I'm about to say bad things about them. I see movies on like streaming services and you think, <laughs> This movie has a distribution deal, and like performances are bad. It's shot poorly. It's dialogue's terrible. Uh, dialogue is awful. <laughs> it's like it's like turn it off. Maybe it'll be better if you don't listen to what they're saying, sort of thing. Yeah. And um, and I think that those people just in like they they sweet spot of a genre thing that that maybe like right. knew had a bigger audience, but also at the yeah. same time, those people thought that their movie was going to save the universe. And they didn't. They didn't see any of their. They they looked in the mirrors and saw a glowing, glowing picture of themselves and said, "Our movie's th- good enough to go here." And they just like had faith in their own thing. Maybe it was ignorance is bliss. Maybe it was like all sorts of like uh, just naivete, whatever. Maybe they just don't give a shit and they're like, "Well, let's see what happens." But for for me, I am. I, and I know this is a problem. I'm not saying people should be like this, but I'm I'm like, well, it's not uh, Goodfellas or, you know, uh, Boogie Nights, which are two of my all time favorite movies. And I'm like, well, we didn't make Boogie Nights with this. <laughs> it's not Boogie Nights. So that's me trying to be honest with myself about what we did, because you don't want to think you're just the world's greatest gift or whatever. You never really learn or grow as a filmmaker that way. But at the same time, it's like this weird balance you got to get into where it's like, you know, it's not good fellas, but it, it's not as, it's not never as good as you think it is. It's never quite as awful as you think it is. It's somewhere in the middle. Right. Uh, and you just got to let it be what it is. Yeah. And I, I think like I'm having therapy it, session with Marty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's something that a lot of filmmakers deal with. I mean, when we had our first kind of rising star, like I almost ran out of the house screaming, like I, it was not what I wanted, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's true because like the, the film is never as good as it is in your head when you're shooting it. And it's never as bad as the first cut when you're done cutting it. Like these things take time and, and there's obviously a lot of insecurity that the filmmakers have to deal with because of how much of themselves are putting into something yeah, like yeah, this. Yeah. But I mean, that's, it's a common thing, you know, and, and in my experience, you know, the more you do it, the more it helps sort of mute that. And also another thing, which, which is unique to us, I think the more you teach it, the more you're able to sort of put it down because the more you're living with those things, the easier it becomes to, to execute them. I think I, I always say that it's like, making something is like standing in front of a mirror naked and you see all the flaws and you see all the things, but you still have to put your clothes on and go out there and kick ass that day. Um, some days better than (laughs) some days are go better than others. You know, a shirt still feels like maybe it's fitting me a little too tight. You know, I see all the, all the little things and, uh, it's, it's hard to ignore that because you will not get your, um, get the ball pushed further down the to use the analogy I used before down the field if you get to the point you're on the threshold and you're like we have this finished movie but nobody's gonna like this movie because it's shitty it was made for this and blah 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 blah, blah. all that stuff you used to talk yourself out of um yeah. that's not gonna get you anywhere so that's true. I, it's a constant battle in your mind uh for me at least uh because i have high expectations of myself 
uh, I have waning expectations of Brad, uh, who, you know, has, he's got his own set of expectations. I'm trying to figure out what those are. Translation, (laughs) you're always surprised when I do something. something. (laughs) Yeah. But you guys need to make a web series of just the two of you. You guys are hilarious. Oh yeah, another thing that no one would watch, and I'd have to go through all sorts <laughs> Here of. Here we go again. <laughs> no, but uh, you just, you just, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know, it's like a. I, I guess I need to. I've been wanting to read the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. Mm-hmm. Have you have you heard of this book? I haven't read it. Yes. I, I think I'm gonna go ahead and it's my next Audible purchase. I tell I'll tell you that. I'm cool. I'm probably just gonna listen to it because. I don't think it means to be cynical. I don't think it means yeah. don't care. It's there's a subtle art of not caring, uh, yeah. care but not like not not like not care about the, what, the next thing that happens react. gonna pull the rug out from under you every yeah. single time you you step yeah. out into the world. Yeah, yeah. If if it helps, I, I know I, everything that you're saying is stuff that I deal with too, I, yeah. and I know almost every filmmaker deals with it at some point, no matter what level they're at, no matter how much how big their budget is, how big their actors are, whatever. There's one thing that I always think about that really sort of puts things in perspective. Um, the thing I learned when I was making Rising Star, two things I learned. Um, one is that you are always the choke point, right? Whenever, whenever there's something that needs to get done ultimately you're not doing it is what will 100% stop it. But if you do it, things will move forward, even if they're slowly. Yeah, yeah. So the fact that you've made a feature film says to me that you have a drive mm. and a focus and an ambition that is higher than way, 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 way more people that I know. Yeah, yeah that I enough, believe that too. That, that's huge, that's huge. Yeah. And the other thing, the other thing that I learned is that I was able to take something that I thought about in my head and make it real and tangible so that other people can watch it. Yeah. That's a fucking miracle. <laughs> so few people can do that. Yeah. You did it. Yeah. yeah. I did it. Yeah. So that's enough that's enough to get me out of bed a lot of mornings. I catch so myself I, think- I catch myself I had somebody telling me, Well you should do this and shoot this and I and I was listening to him thinking Wait a minute, you haven't done this. Like, why are you telling me how to do this? And you can't snap back like that. It's like, wait, come back to me when you've actually fucking done it. Because, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not uh, rude enough to tell somebody exactly what I'm thinking when I'm thinking that. Because I don't want to be a dick, but I am thinking uh, we're 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 in a club now that's uh, still a huge club when you, like, the long tail of people that have done all that stuff but it's a much smaller group of people because i see every day on social media twitter uh facebook people that talk about um when i when i i finished a screenplay last week i uh, finished the screenplay it's actually something that almost downloaded into my brain fully formed i just had to type it out so i wrote it in like five days um um it took me about two three weeks to get the thing out but it's just it just was fast and i had some extra time one week that just happened to be like, oh, I'm just sitting here waiting on my daughter for three or four hours at a time. And I wrote, everybody's sort of like, how do you do that? And they're like, I, I need to do that. I need to do that. I'm like, yeah, you do need to do it. And how I did it was I set the fuck down and did it. Um, I've done it. That was my 19th feature length screenplay. Uh, nice. No good, good, bad or not. They just, I finished 19, like uh, I think Isaac Asimov said, it's just as hard to finish a bad book as it is to finish a good book because it's a psychological magic trick you have to do on yourself to say, these words are going to mean something. So just keep, keep going. Um, so it's, it's weird because I'm not really a pessimistic person or a cynical person and I'm less so these days than I was maybe even six months ago. Uh, but you're right. The, the Marty pep talk worked on me. So maybe the Marty Pep talk works on everybody else. Uh, I'm glad you were able to go through it. So I did have one more question for you about uh, you're you're not a you're not a twenty something anymore, right? Like you're not a young twenty something anymore. No. So what's it like going back to school in your? You're not even a thirty something. You said in your forties. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what's that like? You're are you in? like class with like a bunch of kids and you're like, ha you kids are going to learn someday. The world does not revolve around you sort of thing or what? <laughs> well, there's, there's two pieces to that. Um, the, the program that I'm in 
is a, it's a Master of Fine Arts program mm -hmm. in screenwriting, and I've only got like eight or nine other students in my class. Most of them are in their like late 20s, early 30s. There's one who's in their uh, early 20s. Okay. Um, so the, that, that class skews older. I'm not the oldest person in my class, but I'm, oh, I'm cool. one of the older ones. So that's really nice. Um, there hasn't been so much of that in the class experience, but working as a staff member in the film school, I have interns that work for me in the script library, and all of them are 18 to 22 or a couple that are a little bit older. Yeah. And there's plenty of that, oh, you kids, oh, if you only knew. Like, I, I think that daily. Um, What's VHS, you know, Uncle Marty? <laughs> <laughs> What's VHS? What's DV? What? What's that? <laughs> DV, um, oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's a, definitely a lot of watching them and how they react to things mm -hmm. and thinking back about how I used to deal with them. Because there's students now that, that, I, that are my interns That'll come in and they'll just sit down and watch a TV show on Netflix on their phone with their earbuds in and they're completely zoned out and they're just watching this. And I'm thinking, you know, 20 years ago, I used to have to get a floppy disk to get access to my email. Yeah. You know, it's, it, they're really, it really is a huge change. But when it comes down to it, students are students, filmmakers are filmmakers, yeah. you know, and they're, they're at, just at a different point in their career than I am. You know so, what you need uh, is a sitcom of your office, like The Office, but with Marty and his 18 to 22 year old interns talking about how the world really works. Like, uh, what's that show? Uh, Boy Meets, is it Boy Meets World? Boy Meets World? Yeah. There, Where you yeah, have the old we, teacher that goes, well, here, guys, you know. We've actually talked about that and we have a title for it, believe it or not. What is uh, it? It's called, it's called Old Man on Campus. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Is that what you're writing a thesis? <laughs> Is that your thesis? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're 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 you decided in the last couple of years to, I guess, in the last couple of years to really focus on screenwriting as an entry into um, more filmmaking jobs, or like to market yourself as a writer, or to hone your writing skills so you have writing, so you have better scripts to direct. That I think was the goal. Yeah. That was that was the original goal. Um, yeah. I I got into this program. I actually don't I, I don't need the degree because I already have a master's. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted to go through this because I, I really wanted to focus on my writing. That was one of the things about Rising Star that I wish was better. Um, you know, what was that the the script was tighter. Yeah. And yeah, me that too. Really, with, with our film. Yeah, and I think that's a common thing. So, you know, I was I was lucky, you know, I was, I was able to get into this program and, and they offered me a job, so that was great. Yeah. Um, so really going through the program has been a, a focus on getting my writing better. And now that I'm almost done, I, I graduate in May, I'll have two or three things, you know, right out of the gate that I know that with a little bit more work will be strong and will be something that I know I can put something to as a director that would be stronger than Rising Star. So if I could put you on the spot for a second, what do you think the top, I don't know, top three lessons you've learned in the uh, Masters of Fine Arts and Screenwriting class you've been taking that you either knew before and thought, yeah, you just sort of been avoiding or like stuff like epiphany moments that were like, oh shit, like that you thought, you never thought you didn't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because you've been writing yeah. for a long time, just like the rest of us. Like what didn't you know about screenwriting after all this time? Well, the first thing, and it's going to sound really basic, um, but it really, it really hit home for me in this program, is that conflict is the lifeblood of drama. And there needs to be serious conflict in every scene you write, otherwise a film slows down. Mm -hmm. And I went back and watched Rising Star, and that was, it was proven true. Like, every small moment was because there was nothing going on. Oh, yeah. uh, so that was definitely the biggest thing. Yeah. Um, I found that it's okay to write characters that are not 100% based on me and my own life. Um, that's mm. another thing that I've found, uh, mm. and that's been kind of interesting. So the stories I write now are kind of inspired by things that I've gone through, but not literal recreations. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that took me a little bit. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, what else? What else would be the big thing? Um, I guess the third thing is that writing TV is a lot of fun. Really? That's something, yeah. That's something that I hadn't done before I got there, yeah. and I, I've written half-hour specs 
pilots, and I wrote a one-hour spec for Black Mirror, yeah. and I really, I really had a lot of fun writing that. Yeah. So that's something I want to do more of. It's weird because I, I, I have the same thing when I sit down and try to write a play. You read a, you read our script for totally, really pathetic and totally yeah. awkward. It was a play, you know, but we were calling it a screenplay, um, in a way, for the most part. Uh, but if I, when I sit down and think I'm going to write a play, my brain just goes, you're writing a play. You've never done that before. <laughs> so like writing yeah. television, which I tried, I have an idea for a TV show, um, uh, that has been in so many different iterations of different kinds of writings throughout my life. But I sat down and I was like outlining what would be the pilot. And I just practically, I was like, I finally just stopped because i need to know more about writing a one hour series before i sit down and write one because you know i i don't think you need to know everything yeah to 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 write but i need i didn't know anything and i was too busy going well how is this different from a screenplay how it's different from an actual screenplay is a a five shot five act structure right structure in a way i guess i guess things that show up on like hbo which don't have commercials it's it's kind of a little bit different, but for me, I was in. I got. I couldn't get my head around the like five act thing. So how do you do? So Breaking Bad is my favorite show ever, mm-hmm. really, and uh, it's so good. You can sit there and talk yourself out of. I'm never going to write Breaking Bad because that's Breaking yeah. Bad, and I'm Becca Meyer. But um, yeah. so, uh, but you gave us. I will say, you always give great advice, Marty Lang. You gave okay. us. You gave us some. You read our script. You're one of the few people that we asked to read our script, and you did us the favor of reading our script before we shot it. And uh, you gave us one bit of advice that you gave us a bunch of advice, but one of the bit of advices that that we actually took was, um, <laughs> um, which we took a lot of them, but one of them that we actually took and that really impacted our overall film is there was a character in there named Kate that everybody read the script and they loved her, but she was not in it until almost the third act of the film, the last 20 or 30 minutes. And you said to us, find a way to put her in there more. And we didn't get her in there a whole lot more, but we got her in there, what, maybe 15 or 20 minutes early in the thing. She pops up yeah. for a second. You get just like her flavor. She shows up like in the middle a yeah. little bit. And uh, <laughs> she is everyone's favorite character. You were right about that. She is everyone's favorite character. I loved her too. I loved we loved writing her because we loved how she just you she know She was my favorite character. Yeah. And uh Brad's actually in love with her. Um <laughs> She might hear this. <laughs> no, she you I just you made it yourself. real. I you made it real. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um she but Brad, she already knows. Everyone's she in love knows. with her. Yeah. But but uh, so it it did, and you're you're just like give it because she was great to listen to. She said things that people weren't uh, nobody else was going to say, and she said things the way that nobody else was going to say them. And yep. I don't know if we hit it out of the park with that, but your your little vice you got to get her in there sooner because it's obvious that she's like a great character. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. They of people course. when we when we did premiere our film, um, people loved her. Uh, people loved a lot of things in there, but she, when she popped on, everyone was like, <laughs> okay, because it's, it's unsettling. She is g- grouchy. She's grumpy. You yeah. know what I mean? And it's fun to listen to and fun to watch. So thank you for that. Cool, of course. I'm oh, happy to help. Um, well, that's it. If people want to follow you, get it, you know, follow along with your like screenwriting or your filmmaking journeys. Like where do they, where do you want them to go to, to catch yeah, it? Yeah. Uh, Twitter is where I hang out the most. Um, you can find me at Marty, M-A-R-T-Y underscore Lang, L-A-N-G. Uh, definitely, yeah, come say hello. Uh, you know, I post a lot of stuff about filmmaking, um, about politics. Uh, I'm pretty progressive, so fair warning. Um, yeah. But, like, you know, and, and if you want to connect and chat, happy to talk about with you about anything film-related. Awesome. Well, we always, I always love talking to you. We, we used getting you on our podcast as an excuse to have another conversation with you. It was really, really what it is. I don't know if you could tell, <laughs> but uh, if you want to catch us, we're filmmaking, po- uh, no, we're not filmmaking podcast. We're a film reverie podcast at gmail.com. I'm Becca Meyer. That's Balding Ewok. Yep. Brad on Twitter, Instagram, and all that stuff. And uh, it, we, we have failed to mention this a lot. If you like hearing us talk about how to make movies, we talk about movies on our other podcasts. It's a movie review show uh, where it's a lot more of Brad and mine just like shooting the shit. We're not really a, 
like it, I, I don't know. We're but not it's, really teaching on it's that. A little, show. Yeah, yeah, it's a little <laughs> more like entertainment. But uh, if you, you know, we see a lot of movies and talk about how, what we thought about them. Yes. Yeah. And make fun of each other. Yeah. Well, you. Movieisms. Yeah, yeah movie-ism. make fun of me. Movieism. So that's it for this time. We will, until next time, go make something. And as always, the end. And cut. Film Reverie Podcast is a production of Super Mega Ultra Entertainment and is produced by Michael Beckemeyer and Bradley Kingston. If you're enjoying this podcast, please be sure to leave us a five-star review in iTunes and visit filmreverie.com to listen to past episodes and be sure to click like or subscribe wherever you find us. That's it for this time. We'll see you again next week with another episode of Film Reverie.